Hi, Sam Baxendale here, co-founder of Kinetic Hiring. And in today's Insight and Demand, we're going to be talking about the vitally important topic of diversity and inclusion in the modern work setting. Now here in Malaysia, whilst progress has certainly been made in the last few years in particular, um, diversity inclusion is still not where it needs to be. There's still a lot of work to be done. And my observations looking at how diversity in inclusion is integrated into boardroom strategy, it's not often not well defined enough. It's not front and center. And it's not really perceived as a pillar of the business that is likely to deliver effectively to the bottom line of the business, which is quite frankly not true. So there's clearly work to be done. And here to talk about this topic, is Asha Menon, who's a highly experienced HR practitioner. She's Malaysian, 20 years experience, and she's held senior positions with the likes of Citibank uh, and with iProperty Group, who have more recently become REA Group. And she's now set, her, set up her own private consultancy, AM Talent Partners. So here today to talk to about this topic is Asha. So we look forward to hearing her views on the topic. Thank you so much for joining us today. So for the benefit of the audience, why don't you tell us a bit about your background and what you've been up to lately? Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for having me here. Our pleasure. And uh, I was really pleased when you contacted me and, um, you know, and asked me to speak about a topic that is close to heart and I'm very passionate about. So thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, and as you know, I've exited the corporate world two and a half years ago okay. and uh, got into the cons consulting space. Um, I've been pretty much doing the entire, uh, fronting the entire HR um, agenda mm. from you know uh, A to Z. Mm. I do a bit of audit work um, okay. in the HR domain as well. Okay. Uh, working with different sorts of clients from yes. startups to um, you know small business enterprises okay. uh, across the globe. Okay. Which is really really um, very liberating okay. and uh, on so many levels and yeah. Uh, yeah really enjoying it. Fantastic. Well, that's great to hear. So on to the topic of today, uh, we're talking about diversity and inclusion. As a, as a key feature of the, of the HR portfolio in the modern work setting here um, in the context of Malaysia as much as possible. To start, um, why, why don't you tell us, uh, spend a, let's spend a few minutes talking about why DNI is so important uh, to any company and how does it impact the bottom line? You know, because that's what boards are most interested in. So let's get straight to the point. You know, why is DNI such an important business topic, a uh, bottom line point of view to start with? Sure. Uh, if I may just start uh, by you know, just quoting a, a quote or a statement yeah. uh, that Apple uses, right? So it says the most innovative company must also be the most diverse, okay. right? That's actually a very strong statement mm -hmm. and it proves that uh, when you have a diverse workforce, okay. right, it's sort of like it, you would only ripple the, the advantages and the benefits, okay. right? So I would state some numbers later on, but yeah. I think, you know, uh, earlier from the onset, I would like to just clarify any misconceptions uh, when it comes to the area of diversity and inclusion. Okay. Uh, and if you ask me, I would like to relabel uh, the term diversity and inclusion simply because I would call it inclusion and diversity. And perhaps, you know, now there is a lot of ways of re-engineering or kind of rebranding the entire portfolio. Mm. Uh, and what's coming up uh, or rather to be attached to the portfolio is also well-being okay. and uh, uh, equality okay. at the same time. But it's very important to understand that without inclusion, right, diversity in it on its own means nothing. Okay. Right. So um, when you kind of look from a layman's perspective, right, what, you know, the, the general uh, workforce would actually understand by the word diversity itself is basically about the, the what makes you you and what makes me me, right? Um, so it's about the ethnicity, background, you know, gender, uh, background or age, you know, which are very obvious and which is apparent, mm. right? And I think that um, because diversity and inclusion goes hand in hand yeah. or synonymously, uh, there is a lazy assumption mm. that it is the same thing, okay. you know, and it's not, okay. right? So um, to me, I think um, there is a lot of hype 
around diversity mm. and lesser around inclusion okay. in itself. Yeah. Uh, but in order for diversity to really work um, and to be part of the organization culture, uh, you cannot leave inclusion out. Yeah. You know, and, okay. and that's the fabric of the entire um, piece. Yeah. Right. So as a starting point, you say that people address uh, d and in the wrong way because there's a misconception about the relationship between diversity and inclusion. From Absolutely the, from the get -go. right. Yeah, okay. absolutely right. Okay. And if you were to, uh, and I've been having a lot of conversations with um, the HR folks, and when you bring up about this topic of diversity and inclusion, immediately, you know, they snap the finger and say, yeah, we kind of do diversity in our organization. And then when you really probe further, mm. and all they're kind of doing is just reporting on demographics. Right, okay. You know, so yeah. um, that's something that so, I think- So inclusion is something that happens downstream. Absolutely. Yeah. Inclusion is literally, basically, um, how does your workforce actually feel, mm. you know, being in the organization? Are their voice being heard? Mm. Do they feel valued? Do yeah. they feel belonged? Yeah. Um, you know, is it a safe space where they can actually uh, voice out and provide feedback and opinion yeah. without having the fear of any repercussions? Yeah. So there's danger in DNI just being a bit of a label, ignoring exactly. all of the hard work that happens to really drive an inclusion culture. Precisely, and okay. I think you know that's the danger of kind of what you put out on social media mm. versus what actually happens at ground level. So Asha, moving on to the next topic, um, what does data tell us about the role of uh, diversity and inclusion and its impact to businesses? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and uh, when you look at data in itself, you probably would only see data sort of being churned in the last, say, five, six years, mm. right? Uh, and I think I'm talking, uh, when it comes to data, not so much from a Malaysian context, because mm. you know I don't think we're kind of tracking um, really thorough, detailed sort of you know information, okay. right? So it's more global um, data or stats that we're looking at. Mm. And I'm just going to quote uh, from a report from Deloitte. Uh, this is a 2018 report okay. where it says inclusive leadership improves team performance by 17 percent, right? Okay. Um, decision making quality by 20 percent and team collaboration by 29%. Okay. Right? Now these are glaring numbers and uh, you know I, and I think that it's probably covering a very segmented yeah. sort of market. Um, but if you really look at it across, mm. right, um, with having more inclusiveness in you know as part of, of the organization culture. Yeah. You know, and having, uh, and we also we've seen numbers where different, you know, from different sources, when you have more women leadership mm. at, uh, you know, either the board level or the executive level, mm. uh, that's kind of, you know, really tripling the the revenue margin or the profit, you know, margin. So you can't right. avoid, uh, you can't ignore the data. So what's your take on? How do you interpret that data? How does DNI uh, translate to, to better, obviously, better results? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, when you are transparent about your culture mm. and uh, and I have to say that you really want to, you know, get data or rather, you know, get a sense or a pulse uh, from people across the organization. Mm. And it's not just basically talking to the leadership level or the mm. management level and taking it, you know, face value mm. and that's what it represents mm. the entire organization okay that's not the case right mm. so uh we really want to be mindful here because i um I, i'm you know very candidly i'd like to share um during one of my conversations with a ceo mm. um, he appeared to think that there was no issues in terms of diversity, team diversity, uh, in terms of the hiring process, yeah. uh, and also in terms of inclusiveness, yeah. right? Uh, in his mind, everything was fine. Yes. You know, but what I did was I actually started talking to people on the ground yep. and getting real-time feedback, yep. right? You're hearing it from the horse's mouth itself. Sure. And I think it was a very, very different uh, perception or, or you know, what they shared with me was yep. completely different. And do you think this is a, a common issue? As an example, you, pick, you picked a particular example there. Do you think that's a, a common issue that you're seeing in the market? 
and that represents a, a wider issue that needs needs addressing. Yes, I think uh, it's safe enough for me to say or to generalize it because mm. I I do tend to feel that uh, most of the time, uh, at least from the senior management or leadership point of view, mm. uh, this is not the topic or an agenda yep. that demands enough attention and focus. Right. Right. Present. And it's always at the back burner. Yeah. Okay. So and that's harming business. Absolutely. As, as, the, absolutely. Data, as the data tells us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Aisha, it seems from your from your last comment that there's a bit of a misconception uh, amongst the C level community uh, regarding the um, level of diversity inclusion within their businesses here in Malaysia. So so where does responsibility start and stop with? Does it start with boards? Does it start with HR departments? And you know how can we start to uh, address this issue on a, on a broader level? Oh, I love that question. Um, so I think uh, a really good way to really answer that question would mm. be to look at, um, so if you look at the Malaysian context and if you look within uh, the different departments, often um, the, di the role of diversity and inclusion or the, the function of diversity and inclusion uh, typically falls within the HR team or okay. the people and culture team, right? Um, and I haven't seen too many companies here in Malaysia uh, who really mean what they say and, and walk the talk uh, in terms of giving importance to um, d and okay. Because if, if that really what it, it is what it is, then you would see more companies sort of like um, creating a dedicated uh, role or position or mm. portfolio mm. to drive you know mm. the agendas forward yeah um and and that's what really means business when it you know when you you are committed you are dedicated you are determined to make a change mm. and uh so maybe there's a bit of complacency still that this, what, this function is not yeah. being invested in and that, yes. that tells us everything we need to know yeah and, yeah and globally you would see you know maybe in, in the western uh space you would see uh more companies right now are actually hiring for you know either chief mm. diversity and inclusion officer you see um you know dedicated roles being created to mm. sort of like take this on and 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 yeah. uh, and make it an agenda and give it you know enough importance yeah uh, so, if, so failing the um I, you know the role itself in an isolated way um also what's your observation on the the hr portfolio as it stands and the extent to which it is a uh, you know key metric that businesses measure themselves around and take seriously yeah and, and i think that's what I was, I was kind of uh coming to so mm. when you kind of park that role or mm. that function uh into hr Right, and and I've been there myself, and I mm. and I, I say this because um, I know that on a day-to-day -day basis, right, we HR folks we are always firefighting, you know, the burning issues to look into, and uh, and diversity and inclusion is not at the forefront of my mm. mind to make it a business priority. Yeah. Right. So it's always about you know what needs to the fire that needs to be put off first, yes. and then I'll come back to it eventually. Yeah. Right, um, and when you ask me where does the responsibility lie, I would say that it cannot just lie, you know, uh, basically at HR's desk, right? Because though HR can be the facilitator or the guardian mm. to put things together, to come up with strategies and um, plans and programs to drive the uh, DNI agenda forward, mm. but I think. Uh, eventually, the responsibility have to lie with every single member in the organization. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So the more you make it uh, a conversational point, uh, a topic, mm. and everybody is comfortable to talk about it, yeah. right? And it's ingrained in us, yeah. and that's where you really see change happening. Yeah, so it kind of collectively sits within the culture of an organization. Yes. Okay. I guess I should look in a little bit more optimistically at the market, uh, either in Malaysia or perhaps what you've seen outside of Malaysia. Can you give us some examples of some great DNI practices that you've seen, and um, you know, give us a bit of a description of what that looks like? Sure. Uh, be happy to. Um, now, there are various different companies who are doing um, some great work in this space, and um, though I cannot really 
vouch or I do not have enough data to support and substantiate what I'm going to be stating, they could be really good in making you know, um, some wonderful progress in a particular area of DNI, uh, but that does not necessarily mean that it's the best in terms of the entire scope mm. of DNI, mm, okay. right? So if you look at companies, for example, like L'Oreal, mm. right? They're kind of leading and fronting um, when it comes to uh, disability awareness. Okay. You know, so they've done some great work in India to raise awareness in terms of hiring and empowering people mm. with disabilities. Okay. Uh, multicultural, that's mm. another strength. Mm. Um, and they've also been on top of the list for gender equality. Okay. Right? And then you have companies like Lenovo, mm. right? They've got a program that um, is really typically, it's um, kind of really empowering women mm. to step up and play or take on more leadership roles. So okay. they have a women leadership development program. Okay. Right. Um, and when you look at uh, Nestle, for example, okay. again, um, some very good work around gender equality and gender balance. Okay. Um, now, my favorite is, is one that I came across recently. Okay. Um, I don't know whether you've heard of this company called Zomato. Heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, and I think that uh, we need more companies who are bold enough yeah. to really drive uh, diversity and inclusion from a very non-conventional way. Okay. Right. So they came up and said that they are introducing. Uh, it has been implemented. What I hear, uh, period leaves for women and transgender. Okay. Right. Um, basically, it's not something that they are saying that it's a benefit, but mm -hmm. the way uh, they came out and, and communicated that and the messaging around that okay. was around fostering a culture of trust, truth and acceptance. Okay. Right. So it's also pretty much about how you carve your message and what you communicate because that that's eventually what people is going to perceive yep. and how they perceive yep. it's so important right and they did not just stop there because they went on to also um, educate and, and create this awareness for the male workers or okay. colleagues right in terms of when you have a team member uh, who is a woman in your in your team who's taking you know period leave right and if you were to make any in non-appropriate comments, mm. right? There are consequences. Of course, okay. right? And it's also basically saying that it's part of nature. Mm. There is no need for us to shy away from talking about these yep. things, right? It is nature. It is, you know, being human, and uh, it was fantastic to see that message. Yes, you know. I know yeah. that that translates uh, positively in terms of employer branding, retention, and people feeling like they're part of a culture that is special, and. Um, is progressive and Absolutely. that leads to better better results in terms of I guess business results. Absolutely, down the line. and yeah, I so think it's a serious basis for it. Yeah, right on point because yeah. if you look at uh, in terms of people who were taking time off or taking you know uh, leave or sick leave, mm. right, for that matter. Uh, and and I know I, I've done this myself, right? Mm. And I and and you know I'm sure your wife at some point would have also you know um, been sick when it's the time of the month. Right. So why do we need to lie and, and not show up to work or having uh, that fear of yes. saying what it is? So it's kind of normalizing it is is. the topic. Absolutely. So I guess the progressive nature of what you're talking about, Usher, is uh, taking topics uh, that might be considered a bit of a taboo and kind of normalizing it. So everyone's comfortable around the topic and, Absolutely. you know, we can and they can then build policies around it that are that much more accommodating. That's that's truly what it is. And I think that, you know, we could do a lot more work around um, the taboo around mm. single mothers, mm. uh, people who have gone through divorces, right? Uh, and I think, you know, most of the time you want to avoid this these conversations mm. or these topics, but I think it's time now to really... Just address, uh, these, bring address it, these things head on. Yeah, you know, um, and I think that's where you're really going to um, either increase the needle or make some very, very progressive change. Absolutely. So looking at the flip side, um, give us some examples of perhaps uh, mistakes businesses are making right now when it comes to rolling out their DNI, DNI uh, plans or, or otherwise maybe they don't even have a plan and that's the problem. 
So maybe talk us through that. Yes, um, I think you know what most companies are doing, like I said, because either um, not having a dedicated resource or the right tools to really drive these initiatives, uh, what I see most people doing is sort of like taking something off the shelf, mm. right? And uh, it's, it's already there, just take it and, and trying to plug into you know, the current situation. Now, let me tell you, that's not going to work. Mm. Because if you don't really study your own demographic um, and, and know your people, right, um, then you can't have a one size fit all sort of an approach. Uh, and, and I can guarantee you that, you know, it might actually sort of like get you moving initially, but it's going to crumble, mm. right? So the, the most important thing is, like I said, uh, when you really look at diversity and inclusion, are you looking at, you know, there are different areas, you know, that you could really dive in deeper uh, and to do some, some good work around that, mm. right? So one particular area where I would like to really uh, advocate and, and talk more about is around the area of cognitive diversity. Okay. Right? Uh, now that's becoming um, the new frontier in terms of, you know, um, when we look at diversity per se, right? What does that mean? It just means that the diversity in the way we think, right? How many companies mm. are really sort of like empowering their people mm. and supporting people to think in different ways, mm. different, you know, um, to, to really welcome that uh, thought, you know, diversity in thought, okay. right? This could be linked to sort of conscious bias and unconscious bias, perhaps. Then, absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, when you look at hiring, for example, mm. right, and we see recruiters kind of putting out that same copy paste kind mm. of you know job description, and Definitely there is no uh, effort in terms of really understanding what your target pool is looking like, mm. and challenging yourself, you know, to move away from status quo, mm. right. If I need someone, say for example, to do a role in HR, right? Uh, why can't I look outside the, the typical HR domain mm. and look at someone who's perhaps done marketing? Okay. You know, yeah. uh, because I think that it's human nature is that we want to really look at people that are very much like us. Yeah, higher in our own vein. Yeah. Yes, right. So yeah. you're kind of bringing on you know, adding to your team mm. people who have that similar kind of profile, mm. personality, behavior, right? And you don't have that uh, that edge to really push you yeah. uh, outside your comfort zone. And it's not going to get you better results yeah. or doing things differently, which would, you know, again, go back to producing, you know, new, new ways of, of doing things, new products, new results. And do you think this is kind of part of what businesses are getting wrong then? They're too restrictive around how they, how they define what good looks like for a role, looking too much at a functional level, not looking enough at a broader competency level, transferable skills wise. Absolutely. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, today, um, when you look at HR, HR has evolved over, you know, a period of time. Mm. And uh, we are looking for people who are more business oriented, you have mm. the business acumen, mm. right? Um, but why do you need someone who's done HR for 15 years, mm. right? Because they've been there in that space mm. and all of us have got blind spots, mm. right? But instead, I would look outside the HR domain and bring in someone with fresh perspective okay. and how can I actually enhance HR mm. and mm. drive HR or rather add that, that marketing bit to HR yeah. so that we could you know, I, thrive in that marketing space. And I guess there's a bit of an analogy there for diversity on a wider level. Absolutely. By failing to observe diversity, we're playing to our own weak spots. Yes. Blind spots rather. Correct, yeah. Yeah. correct, yeah. So um, I would strongly urge um, you know, companies to, to look at um, the non-conventional way of doing things and to really provide that space and opportunity for people to be creative, mm. you know, and to be innovative mm. in, in uh, thinking 
And uh, I think when you look at radical collaboration, and I, and I use this a lot in, in design thinking, so design mm. thinking is also another tool mm. that would uh, help you drive mm. um, the diversity or cognitive diversity uh, and to take it you know, to a different level. Because when you are uh, looking at producing a new product, right, um, or a solution, and if you're getting just your product team to look at that particular product or enhancements to the product, for example, even uh, you look at a problem or a challenge or an issue, uh, bringing in people from different teams or different functions would help you identify that blind spots. Mm. You may not think about you know, those things because you're kind of doing it day in, day out, mm. right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think you know, people should not feel uh, fearful or they should feel safe yep. to really bring out new ideas to the table without having uh, been told that that's not your, you know, that's not your domain, don't interfere and you know, we just want to keep it yep. within you know, the and, team. And the point being businesses should do more to promote that kind of culture exactly. and that policies in place to support it. So Asha, I guess this question is linked to one of the earlier questions about data. I wondered if you could explain to the audience a bit about how can we measure the benefits of having an effective DNI program within your business and, um, and just really how do we know it's working? Can you give us a few examples sure, um, on that and explain and I, that to us? Sure. Um, I think it's very important for any program or initiative that is being implemented or launched to, um, we need to know whether you know it's worked or it, it has not. If it's not, then why? And how mm. can we actually make it better and improve as we go along? Mm. Uh, most of the time that you see, uh, for example, these programs are being rolled out and it's just basically a tick in the box. Mm. Right, because no one is really tracking in terms mm. of the impact, you know, whether it's made a difference, whether it's really addressed, you know, yeah. what the main objective of that particular program or initiative, yeah. you know, in the first I, place. I guess the eye and inclusion. The Correct. Important bit, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So there is no, again, there is no um, a standard way of, of measuring. Mm. Um, I would say that for different initiatives or different programs, you know, there are various different metrics that you can look into and uh, apply. Uh, for example, if you are doing an, an initiative to drive diversity, like which area of diversity? Do you mm. want more gender balance? Do you want more um, race, ethnicity kind mm. of a balance? Um, so what are you trying to um, bring in more millennials, you know, um, into play? Uh, are you also looking at, you know, in the Malaysian context right now, we have aging workforce, of course. right? Yeah. Uh, what, what are plans, you know, for that, mm. right? You know, so if you really, you know, you have to be very specific in terms of what you want to achieve mm. and then create a matrix or a measurement, you know, specifically yeah. for that particular outcome. Yeah, and regularly checking on that to check, Absolutely. check the progress. Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes. And then also, um, very importantly, is to make sure that uh, you have a, a committee or a focus group which represents, you know, the different groups within the organization. Let's see. Right, so it's not just HR mm. uh, driving it, HR measuring yeah. it, HR you know speaking about it, yeah. and then it becomes a HR program. Yeah, it's more of a 360 exactly. inclusive thing. Yeah. So we couldn't talk about this topic without addressing the so-called new norm. Um, so forgive the cliche, but um, I guess what's really interesting for the for the audience is to hear how do we think um, current uh, sort of working conditions have impacted how, how businesses hire and what impact this could have had on, on diversity as a topic, diversity and inclusion. Right. Um, yes, I think, you know, uh, the new norm, there is so much to, to leverage from this uh, new norm. And uh, I, for one, I've been sort of like really lobbying um, for remote working or, you know, mm. the flexi working uh, from the time that I know I've been in the corporate space and mm. always sort of like you know fronting that mm. you know I think uh, there's a little bit of, of a personal interest here mm -hmm. as well but um, now when you really look at it a pandemic just happened mm. and we've literally overnight changed the entire way we work mm. or we function or we perform work mm. right um, and, I, and and you know in many ways I think um, 
people have been very, very um, impressed with the way companies are sort of like embracing new uh, ideas or new ways. Um, the only, you know, if, if there is any kind of um, remorse feeling here, I would say that um, don't do it because you are pressure under under some sort of pressure mm. or you are forced to do it because mm. you know you have a burning situation mm. because that compromises that that feeling of you know um of of really being able to to gain that full benefit mm. of, of something like this right yeah. for example remote working or mm. working from home uh, but if you really kind of do it in a way where you are open you are receptive mm. to um, the benefits that it's going to yield i think um, you know then obviously you know that's basically what the outcome is going to be uh, we've also seen in terms of hiring practices uh, we know that the entire interview process uh, has taken place digitally right virtually and we've we've hired people without having um, to 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 see them physically or mm. to to be in that same space mm. and you know um, mm. the same physical presence it's it's not there mm. um, something that we never used to be okay with. Yes. Right? So that's a huge shift. So looking at those those changes, um, in your view, what is the impact on, on, let's say, the diversity and inclusion and gender? There's probably a host of trickle trickle through impact to that. Yes. So what were your observations? So I that? think, you know, you're able to really uh, attract different kind of people from different mm. background different mm. walk of lives mm. um, and you're opening your, your talent pool a mm. little bit more mm. because if, if you know the opportunity is to work from remotely you don't have to restrict yourself to just those you know within this particular state mm. right you're kind of really opening up the the talent pool yeah. um, and you never know you know you might be able to get some really good talents you know from mm. across um, different parts of the world so you think it's been a catalyst for good in terms of opening up thinking and diversity processes in Malaysia? Absolutely. And okay. also, you know, to sort of like really be creative mm. because, you know, it is a little bit of a competition right now, mm. right? Everybody wants to get in and get the, you know, good yeah. talents. Yeah, it's uh, kind of flick the switch. Exactly, yeah. right? So okay. uh, that's where your branding, you know, your talent branding, your employee value propositions come into play mm, and, and one big way to sort of like win that game or to rather mm. you know uh, be leading in that space yeah. is to really front your your DNI you know um, initiatives absolutely yeah so on to our final question Asha where where would you say we are in Malaysia right now when it comes to diversity inclusion and adoption of best practice oh um, I think uh, we've got a long way to go um, when you really look at you know what's happening uh, within the different different industries, different contexts, and and how the applicability of DNI comes into play. Now, when you look at the the sectors within the Malaysian market in itself, um, it's it's very different, mm -hmm. you know, and the rate of adoption is also very different. Mm -hmm. So I would say that it's you know we've got a long way to go. Okay. Um, but it's very very important and it's vital. Um, to really start doing the work around the DNI um, space, because if you look at the workforce in Malaysia, we've got an aging workforce. You know, yeah. so we have an issue in hand, yeah. and if we don't um, look into ways to cope with this with this issue, mm. um, then over time, and we are already facing, you know, as as we spoke earlier on. The, the brain drain issue or mm. the challenge that we have, you know. Yes. Um, and when you kind of look, I mean, you know, in, if not for this for this pandemic and, and the travel restrictions, mm. we would be seeing more graduates leaving the country, yeah. right? Um, either to further studies or, you know, to, to uh, seek employment yeah. elsewhere. Right? So basically, we've got a finite resource when it comes to people and talent in, in Malaysia. So the last thing we want to do is be putting additional blockers on it. Exactly. And exactly. diversity can help solve the issue. Yes. Um, so, um, just talking about blockers. I mean, what? Give us some examples of where um, you know you, we think you know restrictions are being put up, and how can we alleviate those? Yeah, and I um, I think you know the the main um, issue to really talk about when it comes to diversity and inclusion, Sam, uh, is what I tell my clients all the time is that we can be rolling out fantastic programs and initiatives, right? 
But if you don't address the mindset of the people, yeah, right, that's your number one obstacle. Okay. Right. If people are still going to behave and to to really not buy in to the new ways of doing things, right? It's that same old, same old. Yeah. You know, they would come come, you know, um, to you and tell you that. Oh, this is how we've been doing it all this while. Yes. Right. Why rock the boat? And and how optimistic are you? You know, looking at the let's say the millennial generation coming through and the kind of mindsets uh, of that generation coming through. Do you say the? Would you say the future's bright and where there's room for optimism? Uh, I would like to say the future is intersectional. Uh huh. Right. Um, and we need to start getting comfortable mm. to talk about these issues without yeah. referring to it as taboo or you know I don't want to talk about it I you know it's not something uh, it's a sensitive topic and yeah. I'm not comfortable you know talking about it right yeah. so I think that um, with the Millennials uh, I won't say that we don't have a mindset issue to address we mm. certainly do mm. right uh, and I'm generalizing it but I think overall um, a good place to start would be kind of really looking at the mindset of the people and mm. addressing that, right? Absolutely. So you really want to inculcate the growth mindset and, and drive that forward through that angle. Okay. Well, look, ending on, the, on, a, on a very important topic there, clearly some work to be done, but perhaps some room for optimism as well. But look, Asha, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Um, thank you for talking through this uh, hugely important topic. And, um, thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay guys, so that's all for today. So if you're looking to get an update on all the great footage from today's interview series, uh, remember to go to our website, www.letsgokinetic.com or go to our LinkedIn page, Kinetic Hiring, where you'll see in the section below uh, all of the uh, links to all of our various uh, online sources. So please remember to visit. Um, most importantly, please give your thoughts and feedback in the comment section in the LinkedIn section. And if you enjoyed the session, remember to give us a big thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. And finally, um, if you're really interested in getting real-time updates in terms of new releases, sign up to our newsletter and you get that on a monthly basis. So thanks very much, guys, and we look forward to you joining us for the next session.